Andy, thank you so much for having me at Beckstoffer Farm Center in Red Hills. Uh, I've never been here before. <laughs> good, 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 good. So I have a lot to learn, um, mm. and I definitely feel like um, there are many stories to tell, um, considering you've actually been here since the 1990s. We came in 1997. We started, the first property we bought was in 1997, yeah, yeah. And so what drew you here in the first place? Well. We, we farm and have farmed traditionally in Napa County and in Mendocino County. And in Napa County from, really we were in denial for a little while, but phylloxera hit about 1988. Mm -hmm. And so from 1988 through 1995, we were replanting the Napa Valley. And mm -hmm. we thought once that's done, we thought we would go to Mendocino County and phylloxera would go there. Well, it really never went there. And so we decided we wanted to expand and we really wanted to expand in Cabernet Sauvignon. We are primarily Cabernet Sauvignon growers. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's very little Cabernet Sauvignon in Sonoma County, mm -hmm. and Lake County had a terrible reputation, <laughs> well earned. And so, but we said, we've got to go look. And so we ended up looking, and we ended up coming to the Red Hills, which really is a bit different than just Lake County in general, right. because here we start farming about 2,000 feet above sea level, and Napa we farm at, two, at 200. But we dug lots and lots of holes, if you would, soil pits and mm -hmm. things, and found out that the, the land here was just perfect for Cabernet Sauvignon. Now, we never planted in, uh, in the hills in, in Napa Valley because you get soil streaks and you get lack of uniformity, and mm -hmm. we don't like that in growing Cabernet. But here, all of the soil is blown on by the, by the, hmm. from Mount Kanakta over here. So it's very uniform and very deep and full of pebbles, obsidian pebbles. So it's perfect Cabernet soil. And then we did lots of other research here looking at, so, at diurnals for, for, uh, for weather and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. And found it was just a perfect situation that we could get a Cabernet land and we could get a bunch of it. Right. Well, it's absolutely gorgeous here just looking out over the hills it's so peaceful and beautiful and I know that once upon a time uh, people would stop and fill up their gas tank in Napa <laughs> just to drive up, up here. here to vacation so yeah, uh, yeah. so what what happened what big, caused this shift? Big, big difference um, uh, just the world went on if you mm -hmm. would and nobody in 1997 again it's, it's 20 some years ago this place was so different than it is today right very, very different than it is today in so many things. But it was all about recreation. It wasn't about agriculture or, or vineyards. Mm -hmm. And now we have, we have 1,800 vine acres up here, not just totally because vine acres. And so we came up and we wanted to buy as much as we could before anybody else found out. <laughs> <laughs> and then we started a farm. We started a farm. Okay. But I think that people are beginning, beginning to understand it's still a, a, a a work in process here mm -hmm. about establishing this as a grape growing region. Uh, I think as you know we started in Napa in the 70s mm -hmm. and there are a lot of similarities between the Red Hills in the 2000s and Napa in the 1970s in that you know in the, in the 1970s Napa was known more for the insane asylum on the Mola <laughs> Avenue yes. than it was for vineyards. Um, uh, the, the grapes were better than the wines. Mm -hmm. It was not wine country. I mm -hmm. mean, there was no hospitality, there was no inns, there were no restaurants, anything of that sort. It was, it was really a farming community, a delightful farming community. Uh, but it was, it was a farming community, yeah. and then it began to change. It began to change over a long period of time. It mm -hmm. began to attract, attract um, vintners and, and, wine, and young people to, to mm -hmm. do the wines and things. You have to remember, when we came out in the late 1970s, that there were only two premium wines. One was Palmason and one was Almaden of any importance whatsoever. And there were five wineries or six wineries in Napa whose names you may know, you know, but they're not what the big deal is now. Right. So we think that, that uh, the Red Hills is poised to do that at some point. It'll be different. Mm -hmm. This is high elevation farming. It's very, very different, but it's, it's really premium quality North Coast Cabernet Sauvignon. So speaking of elevation, I think it ranges 2,000 to 2,400 feet here yes, in Red yeah. Hills. So what impact does that have on the, on the actual grapes themselves? You know, 
I really can't tell you exactly what that is. I know that we farm at 200 feet in Napa. We farm at two, start at 2,000 mm -hmm. here. And the air is different. The yeah. light is different. Just the yeah. quality of light is different. Now, a technical viticulturist or someone could explain those things differently, differently mm -hmm. to you. But you get slopes and you get, oh, you get, drain, you get air drainage. Mm -hmm. But mainly it's the quality of the air and the quality of the light. Uh, the American Medical Association, don't hold me to this, but the American Medical Association measures clean air in America. And there are a lot of years when Lake County has the cleanest air in America. Wow. Now what that does to the light coming down, I don't know. Uh, when, we did, when we did our studies back in 1996, 97, mm -hmm. we, found, we looked at temperature move, but we really didn't measure that much light I mean, I don't think many people did yeah. in those days if, if they do today. But light has, a, if you talk, an art, talk to an artist, you know, about what the effect of light is, so it has a major effect, as oh, the yeah. elevation does, because the temperatures are different at elevation. I see. As is the light quality. Um, and so, are there things that you do here differently in terms of, of approaching the farming than, let's say, one of your vineyards on the valley floor of Napa? Uh, yes and no. Basically, okay. no. Uh, when we came, when we came in 1997, there wasn't a real emphasis on quality, yeah. or modern techniques, or environmental sensitivity, and so we farm here exactly like we do in Napa. Okay. But in Napa, we might have a 40-acre ranch, and here we've got a much bigger ranch, so we can do a different. Right. But there's no difference in the viticulture, and the uh, guys in Napa and the, and the guys up here in the Red Hills talk all the time. So basically, the same but different. I mean, you just don't see. This looks like Tuscany, uh, but <laughs> it, that's not like not like the Napa Valley. Yeah. You mentioned something I wanted to ask you about too a bit, which is um, speaking of Napa. I think you know, going back to Robert Mondavi and the, you know, setting this tone of we help each other, we talk to each other, and general, yeah. you know, we look out for the land and and um, and the good of of the entire reputation. So, is it the same up here? Um, Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, okay. and there are less up here, and it's a bigger area, if mm -hmm. you would, but for sure. I mean, and that's part of the deal, in mean, that we can't be great if nobody else is. You know, we just can't be one. Right. So it, we, the Red Hills group sticks together more than anybody else, mm -hmm. if you would. And yes, we do. And we, we try to influence that because we, we, We've been growing Cabernet Sauvignon for a long, long time, and premium Cabernet Sauvignon, and we've been environmentally sensitive for a long time in doing this kind of thing. So we're trying to influence other people to do that, and it's working. I mean, what you see today, you did not see in 1997, yeah. and there's some real premium vineyards here and some great grape growers here who are interested in the same thing we're interested in. Yeah. So if you had to predict the future, let's say 10 years or 20 years from now, what what will Red here? Hills look like? Well, Red Hills look like just like it looks today. I mean, most of it. I think there's, I think there are less than four thousand acres of vineyard potential mm -hmm. in the Red Hills, and we own half of it. Uh, <laughs> and so there's spots all around here. You know, right. that the Obsidian people and the and uh, the boutique people and other people like. So it'll look the same. Mm -hmm. I think it'll look the same, except the interest will be different. You may find a little inn over here in a restaurant in Kelseyville that you never saw before. Yeah. But the way we farm will be much the same. Now, once we once we find the sweet spots. We'll, ch we'll change, we'll cut the yields and do those kind of things and do some more hand work, mm -hmm. if you would. But we, th we say we farm with soft hands and we're gonna continue to farm with soft, environmentally sensitive hands. But it won't look much different. It won't look much different. And for anyone who doesn't know exactly where we are, can you talk about it, put it in context in terms of places people might know, like, like Napa Valley or Sonoma? Well, uh, like you said, people used to come through Napa County to come to Clear Lake, right. come here. We're about 60 miles north and a bit east of Napa County and that, but you come up through Calistoga mm -hmm. and you come up through Middletown, a little town and right. Lower Lake, and then you come here and then Kelseyville, but people might know Kelseyville mm -hmm. is a little bit further up. and. The lake is right over the hill. Yeah. The lake is right over the hill right there. Yeah, yeah I joke so it's about, yeah. beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so it's 60 miles north and a bit east of Napa Valley, yeah. And I know you have um, two major vineyards here, if that's correct, Amber Knowles. Yes. And? 
Crimson Ridge. Crimson Ridge. Okay, so tell me about the two vineyards and well, how they're different. What, what happens is that we we started out with the Amber Knowles Orchard, and that's how it got its name here. As it, it did, it was a big walnut orchard. And here, uh, like I said, the, the soils are deep and they're consistent, and there's a tremendous amount of obsidian here okay. from the eruption of Mount Kanakta. And then when we have bought uh, additional ranches, they've been Amber Knowles North or Amber Knowles Mountain and such like right. that. Can, and they're basically the same soil structure. For some reason, when you go over Route 29 and go up on that hill for Crimson Ridge, all of a sudden you get brown soil huh. and you get, you get gray rocks. Right. Now, I don't know what, how all that happened, but that's normal, you know, that's the normal soil. But it is different. The soils are different over there than they hear a bit. Hmm. Yeah. And you have a research block here in conjunction yeah. with UC Davis. So what are you doing there? What are you researching? Well, it the, the, started out that people were concerned about climate change. And mm -hmm. so they said, let's, let's do something to do climate change. And we're interested in all the ramifications of climate change, but we're also interested in wine quality. Mm -hmm. So my interest was not only to do this large study, which the people at Davis said, the mother of all research projects, right? <laughs> all right okay, uh, that means it costs a lot. <laughs> Thanks okay. for, okay. for breaking down the code. Okay, okay. Down the it's code. expensive. Go to that. But what we have, are, I think there's, there's uh, 3,600 different combinations of rootstocks and clonal material. And we're going to see how they work for drought, drought resistance, heat resistance, and also if we find some mm -hmm. ticks that give us better, better wine quality. Mm -hmm. Now, we've just started this thing. It's located right over here. Yeah. You know, we won't have any grapes for three or four years, and then you can't tell about the wine colleges from the grapes, so you're going to have to make wine. Right. And then that'll be four or five years ago. But it's a long-term project, and it's a, it's, a, it's a very big project. It's a really big project for everybody. And it's not just... It's a perfect spot to grow Cabernet Sauvignon. So we're not growing this, and we, our research isn't for Red Hills Cabernet Sauvignon. It's for North Coast Cabernet everywhere. Okay. The people in Napa County are as interested as the people are here. Well, <laughs> well Napa known as, a, well, Cabernet is known as the king of, of uh, Napa Valley, right? So they should care about Cabernet for the whole But, but anyway, I mean, so, and that's yeah. what justifies a project like this yeah. so that we can do you know, the, of the 4,000 acres we own, we own mm -hmm. 3,000 are Cabernet. Mm -hmm. So we're very interested in doing it in all the counties. Right. And so, but we, we were able to undertake this project when a lot of other people weren't, and we were willing to do it. And for a consumer who loves Napa, has, you know, experienced a lot of the wines that Napa Valley has to offer, but has never tasted wine from Red Hills. Right. What do you think would would draw them in? Or how are they similar and how are they different? Um, one, the wines from Napa County probably cost you about $100 a bottle. <laughs> and so one of the attractions here is to be able to produce really high quality Cabernet Sauvignon in a $60, $40, $60 bottle of wine. And that was one of our attractions, as we have seen, and as you know, we sell a lot into that. Yeah. We're saying, where, where are the masses gonna go? And everybody knows Napa Valley. And so that's like your grandfather's wine. Mm -hmm. So the millennials, millennials and all of those people, they're looking for something new. Up the, so we think the promise of Cabernet Sauvignon here as a totally premium product is great. And much of it at that level, but hopefully we'll, buy, we'll find some sweet spots the other way too. But it's high elevated. When you look at the, the change in temperature from day to night, it's much like Napa. We mm -hmm. both drop 40, 50 degrees. Right. We, we have a shorter growing season than they do, and they have more heat spikes than we do. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, it looks about the same. Mm -hmm. But for people up here and the, the growing, where you find most of this Cabernet today is in California on North Coast products mm -hmm. rather than in, in Red Hills products. And mm -hmm. we're gonna taste one at lunch to see what the forecast is. You can tell what the forecast, where we're gonna go with that. Right. And we need to attract people to come up here and do this. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty exciting. I mean, if you are, people, people always say, can you do this again? You know, you, what we did from then, can you do it yeah. again? Why can you do it again? Right. Well, if you're a young winemaker with limited resources, it'd be really hard to do that in Napa County. Absolutely. Really hard. The mm -hmm. land is too expensive and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Up here, if you, were, if you are an assistant winemaker here or someone who wants to do a project, mm 
Right. Well, you can come up here and the grapes are here and the, the re reception will be great up here okay. and start a project. And what we think is, we think like in Napa County in the 70s, the grapes are better than the wines up here. So it's up to these guys to make the wines better. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge. And right. they can do it. And right. they can do it. The, you, you can live up here. It's, it's clean air. It's just a lovely, yeah. lovely place. It's beautiful. And it'll change. Yeah. And once it becomes wine country, then it's too late. You got to get up early. Right, right. <laughs> so it's a place where um, a young winemaker, to your point, can come and have a little bit more freedom, flexibility than, than a place like Napa Valley that's so established and maybe and, more expensive. And it's just more expensive. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you can buy grapes from us in Napa County, but they're very expensive. Right. But the, the, the opportunity here is, yeah. is, is to be a pioneer, right. to start something yeah. different, to be, be there before everybody knew about it. Yeah. And, and you cannot do that unless you have grape quality. And I think that's the thing we've established here, that the great quality is here. Yeah. And now we have to incentivize people to come up mm -hmm. and make one. And also, somebody comes up and they start a little in. Or start, and so that that's, you can have a couple do this kind of thing. Yeah. And so it's a great opportunity for young people who want to get in on the ground floor for something that's really super quality mm -hmm. and has tremendous promise yeah. in terms of the wine business. Well, I think there's no more um, well-respected or um, renowned name for growing in, in Napa than, than Andy Beckstoffer. So the fact that you're up here. <laughs> <laughs> you're too kind. <laughs> says a lot. <laughs> no, truthfully, and, and I'd, I'd love to ask you a little bit about that too. I mean, what, looking back, can you, are there specific moments where people thought, oh, Andy Beckstoffer, I need to pay attention to him. And, and what were those? Well, I think, if you look back when we decided to come, it surprised everybody mm -hmm. because Lake County, as I said, had a bad reputation. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't come to Lake County. We came for this mm -hmm. and we did things in this way. And actually we created the Red Hills Appalachian to, to make the distinction. Mm -hmm. But we be, they began to see how we farm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing to say, hey, use this cat from Napa. And another <laughs> thing to see how we farm and right. add attention to detail and how we communicated, how we felt yeah. about the community and environmental things. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we brought the same attitude with regard to quality and environmental sensitivity mm -hmm. that we had in Napa. We mm -hmm. don't farm here any different than we farm there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was different. That yeah. was really big and different. And, you know, people were just surprised because nobody else was coming to Lake County. Right. Yeah. So looking back, um, when did you first have an affinity for growing? What drew you really to, to grape growing? Okay, back, um, I think you know the history that I came out with Inglenook and Boyu, and then I started farming. Mm -hmm. And so we were farming all over the Napa Valley, and we were farming properties. And, and we began to think that the ingredient, the prime ingredient for great wines was the vineyard. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of lip service to this back in those days, right. but not more, much action about it. Mm -hmm. So we, and we're a small family. We had no big family fortune or right. big, no partners or anything like that. And so we decided what we could do was buy a vineyard mm -hmm. because it, it, both the vineyard business and the winery business are very capital intensive. And most people mm -hmm. can't do both. That's mm -hmm. why I'm People, and most people decided to be the wineries. Mm -hmm. But we decided the vineyards were important. We don't know exactly why they're so important and what great. And people ask me, for example, what's great about Tokelon? Mm -hmm. And basically I say, I don't know. <laughs> I can tell you what the, what the soils are, what the climate is, what the longitude and latitude and everything like that. But what happens is the total is more than the sum of the parts. You have to do this and see how it works. So if you really are looking at that sort of empirical history, you want vineyards that have been producing great grapes for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we started buying the heritage vineyards in Napa mm -hmm. and we, we, we liked farming. And I, I told people when I was with the corporation, they were, they were a bunch of salesmen. And I found out I like farmers better than I like salesmen. I don't, no disrespect, it's just the way you want to do sure. it. And I like the land. I mean, I, it's something I, I get, 
I get my kicks of saying this is my land rather than right. this is my want bottle of wine. Right. So I like the soil. Yeah. I like doing the soil and I liked farmers. Mm -hmm. And I saw that with owning vineyards, we can make an impact. Yeah. If we, if when I say people need lift service, if any of the wineries or the well-to-do families had been interested, we would have nothing because we had no competition in buying these things. That's why we're able to buy them. Right. But if, if the wineries decided they wanted them, we'd have, we'd have nothing. Mm -hmm. And so we, all through the 80s and the 90s, we bought vineyards. Right. And we, we, the more you, the more they're with them, the more, more you like them. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, yeah. So given that it is a different time and um, someone just wanting to get started would have a very different experience than you did, what would your be advice to someone wanting to start today to follow in your footsteps? Well, I think, I think you, I would say that you can do it in the Red Hills, you can't do it in, in Napa. Mm -hmm. It's just difficult, so people try that here. Mm -hmm. But the first thing you gotta do is, is find out if you have good fruit, yeah. you know, if you wanna do that. And here, you can be an entrepreneur. Yeah. I mean, you can live up here, you can, you know, the, these guys, these assistant winemakers and young winemakers in Napa know how to make wine. They know how to do it. And there are people up here who you don't have to have a winery. You know, you can do that and you can buy grapes. Yeah. And you can come up here and raise a family. I mean, God, you can raise a family up here and afford to raise a family in these little towns. Right. You know, and maybe you start a little inn or a restaurant or something. Mm -hmm. But there's great opportunity for entrepreneurship up here. Yeah. For people who, who <laughs> the, the, you know, the, the, the <laughs> It might have been very romantic, but it's also a business. Yes. <laughs> and so come up and figure out those business things, and you're going to have to do top quality. So you got to start with great grapes. Mm -hmm. So start that and then understand you're running, you're running a business, and you got to promote it and build it. Right. But there's a great opportunity to be a pioneer up here, mm -hmm. to be here before people knew about it. Yeah. And that's where you're going to have to start. That's what we... That's what we did in Napa. People knew about Napa, but they didn't know about Napa. And again, yeah. as, as I... You know, Almaden and Palmasan were the only premium wines and they weren't from Napa. Right. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So do you have your eye on any other uh, regions that you want to invest in? No, no. We, um, all of our people want to live and work up here, all north of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been the case since the 70s. We had great opportunities in the 70s and 80s to go to the Central Coast and in Monterey and other things. But... We wanted Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah. As you know, I came here through Inglenook and Boyu, mm -hmm. and the history of American Cabernet Sauvignon is a history of Inglenook and Boyu. Yeah. And then Chalachef was wanting us to do Cabernet Sauvignon, and we had a heck of a time convincing people to do it. But that's what we want to do. Yeah. And I think the, the best Cabernet in America grows north of San Francisco. Yeah. Plus, we want to be here. We don't want to spend our time in airplanes and cars traveling everywhere. Plus, it's small. Mm -hmm. there, I mean, it's a bunch of small growers and small vendors. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to compete with the massive vendors. Well, we see them here too, but it's mainly a, um, how do I say, a local place. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's, it, it's, there's a culture here about how you do your business and how you communicate with other people that we really like. Yeah. So for such a famous grower, you've never made your own wine. No. What... Uh, kept you from being tempted to do well, that? We, we, we played with that a little bit in the, in the late 80s mm -hmm. and we decided we just didn't want to do that and yeah. we, I, <laughs> traveling around the country talking to young food and beverage managers who ask you the first thing is what's the discount? <laughs> yeah, you get back into that again yeah. but basically it's a lifestyle thing. Mm -hmm. I don't I, the, the wine making process never interests me that much but the grape growing process and the, the buying of land and developing of land always interests me. Right. And like someone once said that just because you can grow potatoes doesn't mean you can sell potato chips. <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. That the owning and operating winery from a management point of view is not a logical extension of owning and operating vineyards. We do things so different that we've got all together all sentences of but from a management point of view mm -hmm. and a lifestyle point of view, very different stuff. See, yeah. most people like you don't want to talk to me all the time. <laughs> they want to talk to the vintners, <laughs> which is okay. To you, and you know that. <laughs> I know that. <laughs>
but that's, it's just a different life. The yeah. travel, the, all that kind of right, thing, and right. going around saying my wine's better than yours. I, yeah. yeah. Uh, so if, uh, if you, someone were to blind taste you on a, on a wine from one of your vineyards, do you think you can pick it out in a lineup? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Now, you could maybe mm -hmm. because you have that palate. That's a, that's a talent that, yeah. that you have that I don't have. That's why you do what you do and I do <laughs> what I do. But the kind of thing, I, I generally don't, I try not to rate the wines. Mm -hmm. The winemakers should do that. The winemakers, yeah. you know, these, these people drink 30 wines, 10 o'clock in the morning, every morning. And so they've developed that palate to teach those nuances. Right. I don't do that. Right. I, don't, I know what I like. And I drink a lot of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm not. I can't pick those things. Okay. Although I can tell you, we've lined them up before, yeah. you know, and taste them, and I can taste the difference in them. Mm -hmm. But to pick out one in a blind, I'm not sure. Got it. Yeah. So, at what point in the growing season do you know that it's going to be a great vintage? Uh, probably at harvest. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can tell all along, but you don't know what's going to happen next. Yeah. I mean, if you, June, July, you don't know what's going to happen in the heat of August. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's going to happen in September, whether it's going to come back. You get a real good idea. Yeah. But you don't know what's going to happen, right. you know, because right. we, we, vines are like people. We want to be comfortable all the time and pretty warm <laughs> and not too hot and not too cold. Yeah. So when that begins to happen, you, you see it. Right. Uh, but it's really late in the process. Yeah. I mean, and people say in June is going to be a great you know, I yeah. mean, you must be selling something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and after many years of, of, of growing, and what keeps you excited? Getting up in the morning. <laughs> I mean, it's still great. And, you know, the, the thing about it, too, we talk about the land and the wine. It's also about the people. It's Absolutely. really about the people. And the thing that distinguishes the wine business, and it distinguishes it more in Napa because it's concentrated. Yeah is the passion of the people. Everybody has passion mm -hmm. for what they do. And it's nice to be around those people, yeah. and it's nice to be around people who can really do quality. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's just, um, you know, I, I don't know if I've said this to you before, but um, I guess it was President Kennedy who said that history won't remember your military might or your economic powers. All they'll remember is your country contribution to culture, world culture. Yes. And so if you look at 1970 when we started here, I mean, I think food and wine is part of culture. Mm -hmm. Nobody in the world in France or Italy or Germany would ever said that Napa Valley Cabernet, or California Cabernet yeah. is at the highest level. It just competes with all of that stuff. Right. But over those past 40 years or so, they do now. Yes. They do now. Yeah. So we have made a contribution to the world's to the United States' contribution to world culture. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the contributions of America to world culture, think about it. Jazz music, movies, yeah. things, not that many. Right. And so if, if Napa Valley Cabernet or North Coast Cabernet um, can be one of those, and you, you, won't, you, can, you won't name 10, right. be part of that mm -hmm. and waking up in the morning and saying it's part of them, this is what it is. Right. It's just, it's very exciting. Yeah. It's very, very exciting. And then to take that and then to expand it to a place like this and see if we can't be, be pioneers here and do something new again, following that great lead. Mm -hmm. And we have the opportunity to do that here. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of um, the contribution of wines from the North Coast and um, to the world, we have seen a lot of people from other regions in the world wanting to get their hands dirty here in, yeah. in the North Coast. So what do you think they recognize about this place well, that they want to be part of it? I think what you're seeing is that you see all of these young French, etc. winemakers mm -hmm. come mm -hmm. because there are no restraints. Yeah. Over there, they have tremendous restraints on what they can do. Right. So they see the new world of, of you know, the North Coast as the opportunity to, to work their magic. And you, you know, they're all over Napa, and we just need to get, we're trying to get them up here to try to do this again. And you will, yeah. today we'll taste uh, Keith Emerson's wine. Yes, on Napa. love Keith. And, yeah. and so you'll see what happens when you, when you make an effort mm -hmm. to make that kind of wine. Most mm -hmm. people here, uh, 
are trying to do a thirty forty dollar bottle of wine, and so we need to 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 motivate people to try to do that. Mm -hmm. And once the the word gets out and you keep waiting for it to get out of you, <laughs> and people begin to do that, I think you'll see them attracted here because they not they can do something that hadn't been done before. Right. You make another Napa Valley, I mean, I shouldn't say this, but you make another Napa Valley wine, great Napa Valley wine, and say, okay. <laughs> you make the first great Red Hills wine, then people say, wow. Yeah. And that's what the opportunity is. Well, I think it's it's exciting for people to feel like they're sort of first to know about something. Yes. And I think this is a perfect example of that, the Red Hills. And, and people, people, I mean, like the millennials, they're looking to find something new. Everybody yes. already knows about these other districts. Right. If they find this, they, that'll be exciting because they'll have found something new. And they are all into exploration Absolutely. and trying. So this is a great opportunity for them as well. Yeah. Well, I'm just so excited to have spent this time with you. So grateful you. for any time I get to spend with well, you. Thank but you. it's been such a learning experience. Again, my my first time here. I can't believe that, but I'm I'm beyond impressed, and I I can't wait to try some wines at lunch. That's good, and we're gonna take a tour around the vineyards and do that too. So okay. thank you for your interest and for, for coming up. Oh, my thank pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice to be with you again. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. Okay. Thanks.